Well, greetings. Uh, this is Dr. Carl Golnick uh, for, here for another Neuro Ophthalmology CyberSight webinar. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, for me, it's uh, morning time, so good morning, uh, good, good, good day, whatever time it may be for you. Um, you'll notice, perhaps, since I think my last webinar, I may have lost my beard, um, so I'll have to send them another, fo another photo. I look much younger without the beard. I'm sure everyone would agree. So today, we're going to talk about uh, wacky eye movements, weird eye movements. Are they deadly, debilitating, or just dubious? And so we're gonna run through mostly cases in the past neuro-ophthalmology webinars, which are, uh, have been recorded and are on CyberSight. We talked about, a, a, we talked about a couple of, uh, I think in a couple different webinars about different types of common eye movement abnormalities. So cranial nerve palsies and myasthenia and so on. Uh, this talk is sort of a, a more, maybe a little bit more advanced, or I should say probably conditions that are not quite so common. So um, that said, you, you'll probably see some of these things uh, as you go through your practice of ophthalmology. So uh, my objectives for the talk are that uh, we will, uh, when we're done, you'll be able to identify at least three uncommon pathognomonic patterns of eye movements. And number two, determine appropriate testing for the entities that we're going to be looking at mostly through videos. And so we will start with this gentleman um, who's asking me if he's going to be on YouTube. Um, this is a fairly recent video in a fellow with double vision. And you can see that he is trying to look to the right here. And I'm gonna ask you a multiple choice question in a moment. Here he is in left gaze, up gaze, and down gaze. So let's watch his eye movements again. So here he is looking to the right and left. And the video is looping, so he's starting at the beginning. I'll show you one more time. And we're gonna ask you the question on the next slide and then we'll come back to the video and, and look and see. So here we are again, right gaze, left gaze, up gaze, and down gaze. All right, so let's move to our question. So you, you can vote on this with your uh, keyboards, your laptops. Um, what do you think this is called? Is this called a Weber syndrome, a one and a half syndrome, paranoid syndrome, or Wallenberg syndrome? I'm gonna give everybody um, a moment to vote. I ask them not to let everyone see how people are voting while you're voting so that you won't be influenced uh, if there's a predominantly popular choice. Um, so we'll give you another 10 seconds or so and then we'll show the results of the polling. So five, four, three, two, one. Can we show the results? Are people voting? Uh, there we go. All right, so we do have a one most popular vote. About half the people, a little bit more than half, said this is a one and a half syndrome, and you, majority, you are correct. So let's remove that polling and look back and uh, figure this out. So here's our guy again, and uh, hopefully the video will play again. And so here he is. When he looks to the right, you'll notice that the left eye does not move to the right, but the right eye does, but there is this funny nystagmus type movement, so-called abducting nystagmus. So this, this, is, this alone represents a left INO, a left internuclear panoplegia. And when he looks to the left, his eyes move slightly to the left, symmetrically, and he has an almost complete left gaze palsy. So a left INO, and the video is looping, a left INO and a left gaze palsy. So when we use the term gaze palsy, if neither eye moves in a certain direction, so left INO, left gaze palsy, this is called a one and a half. The left gaze palsy is the one, and the left INO is the half. So a one and a half. And this can be due to fairly small lesion. So here we are, there's a one and a half. It could be deadly because of course, if you have a bad problem in your pons, uh, then you could die. 
um, if there were a big stroke or something. It could be debilitating um, because this guy did have a stroke, in fact, and he is somewhat debilitated because of this eye movement problem. So um, deadly, uh, uh, if there were, let's say this was due to a, a, a uh, some sort of a glioma, an intrinsic pontine tumor, that could be deadly eventually, um, but certainly it could at least be debilitating. It may get better or it may not after a stroke, but let's look at the anatomy. So here's a uh, schematic uh, cross-section through the pons, and you'll see here we have the sixth nerve nucleus, we have the medial longitudinal fasciculi, um, so if we call this the left so in this, in this gentleman's case, if there's a lesion here of the MLF and of the PPRF, the horizontal gaze center, this gives you the I and O, that's the half. This would give you a, the one, the gaze palsy. So a lesion that looks like this, pretty small. Or remember that the interneurons that run from the PPRF from the horizontal gaze center run through the sixth nerve nucleus. So, a, a nuclear sixth nerve lesion plus affecting a bit of that adjacent MLF could give you the same picture of what the so-called one and a half syndrome. Now there's something else that sometimes come up and it's called an eight and a half. And so as you might imagine, an eight and a half is our original one and a half plus a problem with the seventh nerve. So here, is labeled, the, here's the motor nucleus of the seventh nerve. So you can imagine that if the lesion were a little bit bigger and it affected the MLF and the horizontal gaze center and the seventh nerve, now you'd have a, what the eye movements we just saw, plus the person would have an ipsilateral seventh nerve palsy, so a facial weakness, and that would be called an eight and a half. So I don't have a good video of an eight and a half. So that's weird, wacky eye movements, number one. And remember, you can type in questions in the chat box anytime. I will not see those questions until the end of the webinar, but we'll try to save five or 10 minutes at the end so that I can answer any of the questions. So type them in whenever you want. You don't have to wait till the end. So this is a fellow, I'm gonna show you his video. Let me just tell you his story briefly. He's a young guy who about five, six years earlier had, was found to have a, a, a posterior fossa tumor, a benign tumor, but he was treated with surgery and with radiation. And this left him with a, a mild to moderate left six nerve palsy. So let's, let's look at his, here are his baseline eye movements. And you can see that he's got a left six. So he's a little esodeviation, a little esotropia. And when he looks, he looks up and down and right just fine, but watch when he looks to the left. So you can see that moderate left abduction deficit. This is his baseline. He says, yes, I have double vision. It's primarily when I look to the left. I'm just gonna run the video again while I'm talking. Primarily when I look to the left, um, he has a little bit of a head turn. He doesn't really want eye muscle surgery. And he's basically, he's content. The problem is recently, over the last some months, he says, you know, sometimes my double vision reverses. I said, Re reverses, what do you mean? He said, well, you know, my eyes have a tendency to cross inward relative to one another, but sometimes they go, they go outward. I said, outward? He said, yeah, they're, they're out, like deviated outward. And I can tell that my double vision has like reversed. And I said, okay, what does it happen at any particular time? Well, it seems like when I'm, if I'm exercising or if I'm active or upset or something like that. And I said, okay, well, uh, let's, let's see, let's take a look. I'm gonna, I don't know if you can see maybe my video on my screen at least. So I said, well, let's take a look. Why don't we, it, will it happen if you're just sitting here? He said, no, I have to be exercising. So we went out into the, the stairwell uh, where we had several flights of stairs. And I said, okay, run up and down the stairs. And he ran up and down the stairs. He ran up and down the stairs. Nothing happened. He ran up and down the stairs. And finally, I said, all right, one more. Let's up and down a few more times. And here's the way he looked after running up and down the stairs. Now he has an adduction deficit. Look at this. And his adduction is good. Look at that. He's exotropic here. And we're watching real-time video. Look, at he's XT. And look at the striking adduction deficit good abduction, but watch what happens. This is over real time. 
And he says, this is typical. It'll, it'll happen and then it will go away over, you know, a minute. So now you see his A deduction deficit is decreasing and his A B deduction deficit is coming back. And eventually he'll be back to his baseline. So this is unedited time wise. Now his A deduction looks pretty good. And his A B deduction, I think we'll show it one more time. A deduction normal, A B deduction back to baseline. Ha <laughs> ha. So the question is what is going on? This is kind of wacky. Um, and we're going to have, this will be a, a polling slide for you guys. So what's going on here? Is this myasthenia gravis? Is this a transient cranial nerve palsy? Is this something called ocular neuromyotonia? Or I have no idea what this is. And we'll let people vote. Uh, I'll give you a few seconds here. All right, so we have kind of a mixed bag. The majority of people, 42%, think this is ocular neuromyotomia. Um, about a third think myasthenia. Uh, some of you are very honest, saying no idea. And a few think transient cranial palsy. So this is indeed, again, the majority is correct. We can get rid of the polling. This is a condition called ocular neuromyotonia. So ocular neuromyotonia is, uh, is, occurs most commonly after skull base radiation. So posterior fossa, cavernous sinus radiation, and usually people have a cranial nerve palsy. It can be three, it can be four, it can be six. I've never seen four, I've seen three. In fact, I'm gonna show you a video of three in a moment. So it can be three, four, or six. And usually what happens is that some years after the treatment, the radiation, um, and the person usually has a, a mild or moderate deficit that has persisted. But once in a while, instead of that nerve working too little, it works too much. And when it works too much, and it if it's the sixth nerve, what happens? It's get, you get this constant firing of the nerve. So the abduction improves, but now there's a restrictive process, and the eye will not adduct. It's not because there's paralysis of the, of the medial rectus. It's because the lateral rectus muscle is tight. The, the, lateral, the sixth nerve keeps firing, firing, firing. There's different theories about what causes this. One of them is called ephaptic transmission, some sort of crosstalk where there's this, this kind of loop where the nerve just fires, 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 fires. It works normally, but it prevents the yoke muscle, in this case the medial rectus muscle, from pulling the eye inward because the lateral rectus is tonically firing because the sixth nerve is repetitively firing. And so that's, that explains this deficit. And then after a short time, usually typically what you're seeing in the video, a minute or so, that sixth nerve gradually stops firing. It goes back to its baseline, partial paralysis, and you see his usual baseline. So this is ocular neuromyotonia, usually after some sort of um, skull base, posterior fossa radiation, um, rarely reported in association with other conditions, even thyroid eye disease. I really don't understand that. I personally have not seen it. So this is left sixth nerve, ocular neuromyotonia. Let's look at a different patient. Um, and so here I wrote uh, prior radiation, rarely vascular compression, and even thyroid eye disease. It is debilitating, it's actually treated. I didn't mention this, you can treat this. Um, I, tr I treat this with um, oxcarbamazepine as opposed to carbamazepine, which requires blood monitoring. So oxcarbamazepine works very well. I, I, you know, I don't see this much. I'm told that in Asia, um, where there's a lot of nasopharyngeal cancer and skull-based radiation, you, people, neuro-ophthalmologists at least, will see it fairly frequently. I've had great results with uh, oxcarbamazepine, also known as trileptal in the United States. Um, and both this gentleman and um, a, another patient uh, of mine, whenever they run out of their prescriptions, call me and say, yeah, I, I, I ran out of my prescription. I stopped taking it. Within days, it started up again. Please refill my prescription for the medication. So here's another patient who uh, has, again, a history of a tumor many years ago. He is cognitively not that with it. He actually has no complaints at all. Uh, but 
his caregivers complain that sometimes, sometimes his right eye turns upward and inward in the eye socket and stays there for a short time. So let's look at his baseline video. And here he is. You can see that he has a, an old partial right third nerve palsy. He's got a little bit of ptosis. His eye doesn't move down fully, doesn't move up fully. It abducts okay. He's not really looking all the way over to the side. There he goes. That's a little bit better. And it adducts okay. But up and down, not normal. So let me just show that one more time. So abduction, not bad. Elevation is not normal. Depression is not completely normal. Adduction may be slightly decreased. There's the depression. You can see the deficit. A little bit of ptosis. So, he, so here's what happens on occasion. And I, I made this happen by having him try to look up and in. And then when I did, and I said, okay, now look straight ahead. Here's how he looks. So let's look at the other video. Now look at his eye. So it's up and in. And when he looks to the right, look at it. It won't move down, and it won't abduct. Look, because he has third nerve, ocular neuromyotonia, in particular with his medial rectus and superior rectus. So now his eye is, is restricted up and in. It won't abduct because the medial rectus keeps firing because that part of the third nerve is, is firing. And it won't go downward because of the superior rectus. So this is third nerve, ocular neuromyotonia. And again, associated with prior radiation, possibly vascular compression, thyroid eye disease. It's debilitating. It's not deadly. It's after, the, after usually a treatment of a tumor with radiation. Okay, any questions, remember, go ahead and feel free to ask them. All right, so let's look at this fellow. He's uh, actually an inpatient, um, and he has these wacky eye movements. He's lying down. He doesn't want to sit up because he's very off balance and has vertigo, it just feels crappy. Interestingly, he did have uh, an upper respiratory infection, flu-type symptoms um, a week or two ago. And you can see his eye movements. I'm going to run that again. <clears throat> and I'm going to ask a question, a multiple choice question about what you think. So let's go to the question. So this is a different kind of a question. So it's sort of assuming you might know what he's got. And the question is, if this was an eight-year-old, now he wasn't, he was a 23, I think, year old. But if you saw these eye movements in an eight-year-old, what would the appropriate evaluation be? Would it be an MRI of the head, lumbar puncture, acetylcholine receptor antibodies, or urine catecholamines? So this is a little different question. It presumes you might know what these eye movements are, and then in an eight-year-old, what would the appropriate evaluation be? All right, so we had no votes for the middle two choices. So MRI of the head or urine catecholamines. So in a, um, an eight-year-old, honestly, probably both of these things would be done. The most important thing would be the urine catecholamines, however. Go ahead and um, we can remove that polling because this is a form of ocular neuromyotonia. Uh, it's, it was his abnormal eye movements, and I might as well move ahead, we'll just play the video again. His abnormal eye movements are conjugate, right? Both eyes are doing the same thing. They're primarily horizontal. There's probably a little bit of vertical component in there. If it's straight horizontal, you could call it ocular flutter, but there's a little bit of vertical from time to time. So, this is a form of ocular neuromyotomia. Now, in his 23-year-old guy, he did not have um, uh, neuroblastoma, which is what we're concerned about in an eight-year-old. So an eight-year-old with neuroblastoma, uh, we're concerned, I mean, excuse me, an eight-year-old with opsoclonus, we're going to be most concerned, and they have neuroblastoma until proven otherwise. And the neuroblastoma is not necessarily in the head, right? They're probably going to end up with a whole body scan uh, because they could have metastatic neuroblastoma, but they could also have a very small neuroblastoma because opsoclonus is a perineoplastic phenomenon, perineoplastic phenomenon. 
and so that, which is a remote effect of the cancer. So antibodies are formed uh, fighting the cancer, but they attack part of the brain. So the MRI of the brain could well be normal. In fact, pa patients who present with uh, oxyclonus and, neuro and are found to have neuroblastoma have a better prognosis than patients who don't develop the oxyclonus because the tumor is often found much earlier because of these wacky eye movements. So in this fellow, it wasn't uh, deadly. It was debilitating while he had it. But it was actually related to his previous viral infection, which sometimes we'll see. So this is opsoclonus. Sometimes you'll see a triad of opsoclonus, myoclonus, and ataxia. Neuroblastoma, until proven otherwise in a kid, it can be post-infectious as it was in this fellow. So opsoclonus, sometimes with myoclonus and ataxia. And it may be deadly. If it's a kid with neuroblastoma, it can definitely be deadly. In this 23-year-old, it was debilitating. It gradually resolved spontaneously with no treatment over about three to four weeks. All right, we'll move ahead. More wacky eye movements. Yeah, so this one may not be that wacky, but we'll see. Let's play the video. You see she's got a patch on her forehead there because she has double vision. And so um, I'm going to ask you what you think about these eye movements. If you have a diagnosis, that may be a little bit tough and not fair because I'm really just showing you her eye movements, not her alignment measurements. I can tell you a little bit more about her history. Let me play the video again. We should all be looping till I stop. But, and that is she, she has double vision, obviously. Um, but interestingly, her double vision is only when she looks to the left and the right. When she looks straight ahead, her vision's blurry. It's not double. But when she covers either eye straight ahead, her vision's fine. But with both eyes open, it's blurry. And that's the story. So she likes to wear the patch not straight ahead, primary position, not because of double vision straight ahead. She has double vision in left and right case, but because of blurry vision in primary position. So we're going to ask a question here. And I think this is the question is, what's the diagnosis? So does she have bilateral fourth nerve palsies? Does she have myasthenia? Does she have thyroid eye disease or none of the above? All right, so the majority of people thought bilateral fourth nerve palsies. Um, there are few votes for all the other categories. Indeed, the, this patient does have bilateral fourth nerve palsies. We can get rid of the poll. And let's look at her eye movements again. And so the key thing about bilateral fourths is that you're, you're looking, and of course, I think if you were being tested, uh, or if you had this patient in your exam room, you'd be looking for what we call shifting hyper deviation. So when she looks to the right, she has a, a left hyper, especially when she looks down and to the right. So down, okay, down to the left, she has a right hyper. And again, you could quickly do your cover uncover testing to show this. So right hyper in left, down and left, left hyper in down and right, shifting hypers. Now, she does not have double vision in primary position, yet she has bilateral fourth nerve palsy. She does not have double vision, but she has very blurry vision. So why is that? Well, obviously, if you have a unilateral fourth nerve palsy, what happens to the eye with the palsy? It moves up and it extorts, right? Because the fourth nerve and the superior oblique muscle are in torters. So in primary position, you're going to have a hyperdeviation and an excyclodeviation. But if you have symmetric bilateral fourths, now both eyes move up, so you eliminate, you subtract the vertical component, and it may be that there is no vertical misalignment. But what happens to the X cyclotorsion? The X cyclotorsion adds. So instead of having a few degrees of X cyclotorsion in primary, now you have two times a few degrees. So the person has blurry vision because they're seeing two images that are superimposed but X cyclotorted relative to one another. When you close either eye, your brain will write the image and you will have clear vision. So bilateral fourths, shifting hypers, and a lot of X cyclotorsion, you would measure that with the double Maddox rod. If you don't have a double Maddox rod and just a single Maddox rod, 
you can put the single Maddox rod in front of one eye. You can ask them to look at the eye chart at the end of the room that has a horizontal edge, straight edge, and to ask them to look at the, your light to see the red line of light in the Maddox rod, and then compare that red line of light to the horizontal edge of the eye chart. So that has been shown to be effective and see if there is a lot of excyclotorsion. So bilateral six, or excuse me, bilateral fourth nerve palsies, and this is usually debilitating, it's usually not deadly, um, and it's certainly not dubious. All right, and this person, the underlying etiology by far the most common reason to see this scenario is closed head injury. Uh, the fourth nerves are long and thin, and come out the back of your brainstem, right? So they, they're easily shaken up from a closed head injury. Usually improve, not always, but usually improve spontaneously. All right, let's move on to another topic. This young woman, well, she's not that young, younger than I am though. She, uh, she was in a motor vehicle accident and she got double vision. Interestingly, she did not have any injuries to herself at all. But her husband, who was the passenger, died. And we're going to look at her eye movements. You can see that she is, I'm trying to get her to look at a target. She's esotropic, clearly here. Oh, now she's really esotropic. And when she looks to the right or left, she can do it. She's got some kind of funny looking movements. And sometimes it almost looks like the, the, the abducting eye isn't abducting quite, like right there, look. And then if you make her look up, oh, look how the eye gradually does come out, but initially it sort of stops. So let's look at this again. So she's ESO, but she gets even more ESO. So watch when I start screwing around with her eyes. She, has a, she develops a larger esotropia. A larger, watch, watch when I remove my hand, whoa. And the times it seems like she has abduction deficits, but then they're not sustained. So, interesting story. Let's see what the audience thinks. What is the diagnosis? Uh, this is another audience polling site. Is it bilateral six nerve palsies? Is it myasthenia? Is it thyroid eye disease? Or is it spasm of the near reflex? All right, so we have uh, two popular votes. One is spasm of the near reflex, one is bilateral six. So sometimes this can, this is indeed spasm of the near reflex. Sometimes this can be confused with bilateral six nerve palsies. Uh, we can get rid of that. Let's look at the video. And the reason it might be confused is because you can see what look like these six nerve palsies. But if you really make them, just make them, just make them look to the left and you see that left abduction deficit, keep them in sustained left gaze. And usually that eye will gradually go out to the left. So it can look like an abduction deficit, but it doesn't stay there. So if you really had bilateral six nerve palsies uh, or unilateral six nerve palsy, the eye's just not going to move there no matter what you do. But with spasm of the near reflex, it usually gradually will. One of the key things you want to look for for spasm of the re near reflex, of course, it may be variable, it may be constant, but look at the pupils. The pupils should be meiotic, right? Because the part of the near reflex is meiosis. And if we watch her pupils, you can see they're pretty small to begin with, but when she's really ESO, the pupils are a little bit smaller. If you can break her, which is what I'm trying to do now, the pupils will get a little bigger, but watch when she gets really esotropic when I cover this eye. And now I'm, she's looking straight ahead. Look at how small those pupils are. Oh, so she's got more spasm of the near reflex. I was trying to break her down to see if I could get rid of the spasm to show that her pupils are even bigger. But so you wanna look closely at the pupils. If someone has intermittent, they look like this intermittently because when they're ESO, they'll be meiotic. And that's a clue that this is spasm of the near reflex. So we don't really know what causes this. I mean, the classic story is a college student studying all night long, um, they get stuck. Um, you can put atropine in the eyes, try to relax their accommodation, and maybe that'll break the spasm, but it can be a problem. I've seen people who have had this for years, and we've tried everything, plus lenses, we've tried everything we can do, cannot get rid of it. And so it really can be a problem, but it's 
it's we think more of a psychiatric sort of a thing uh, than anything else. She had it, we think, of course, because of the, the not of the head trauma. She didn't have head trauma, but her husband died in the accident, which obviously caused a lot of uh, psychological trauma, and we think that's the case. And it did gradually, in her case, go away. So this is spasm of the near reflex. And this is um, uh, debilitating. It can be debilitating, but you can try to treat this with cycloplegic. I'm not sure about psychiatric therapy. We talk about that if it's really persisting. Um, there was a report, interesting, and I, I put this on the slide, a refractive lens exchange. So actually surgery. And the, the report was interesting because it sort of started by saying how great this worked. And then it said, but after a year, it came right back, even though the refractive lens was still in the eye, obviously. So I don't recommend refractive lens exchange. So here's another patient uh, who's really asymptomatic and to watch her eye movements. They seem pretty good here. And yeah, up. Oh. What's going on here? So this is person's asymptomatic. And this is my secretary. She said, oh, I can move one eye at a time. And I said, let me see that. So what, she, what is she doing? She is invoking her near reflex to spasm her convergence and when she does that and let's see if we can see her pupils watch her pupils get smaller a little bit smaller there they get bigger so this is a party trick so this is something that people can do i don't know probably some of you can do this i can't um this is a party trick um and it's not something to worry about obviously all right dubious this is dubious it's not debilitating and it's not deadly party trick. All right, so here's a guy with double vision, and he's in his 50s. He has known um, um, gastric cancer, and of course, because of that, he got imaged uh, when he started complaining of double vision. He, got, he had imaging done, um, and the imaging, um, uh, he brought the CD, because that's one of the things as a neuro-ophthalmologist I always do is I want to see the pictures. I don't trust the reports. In fact, one of the definitions of the neuro-ophthalmologist is a physician who makes a diagnosis based on MRIs that were previously read as normal. So his MRI indeed was read as normal. You can see his eye movements, and his left eye doesn't move up very well. I, do, it's, I, it's, I took the video, I think, and I didn't do a great job. He actually had the biggest problem was with his left eye moving up and in. And I thought this looked like uh, what a, almost like what, what looked like an acquired Brown syndrome. So a Brown's tendon sheet syndrome is when the eye in particular won't move up in adduction. I'm not showing you that very well. You can see the big vertical misalignment when he looks to the right. But he had a striking deficit in elevation that was worse in up and in then it was worse and up and out. And so he, I thought he had this sort of Brown syndrome, and I said, geez, I, you know, I'm surprised the imaging is normal. Let's look at the MRI. And here's the, um, oops, sorry, here's the MRI. So here's the normal scan. Now this was, this MRI was done um, not at my university, uh, not read by one of our good radiologists, but it was done at a community hospital and it was an MRI of the brain because the patient has double vision. And so oftentimes I'll see people, they, they see their family doctor, they see the neurologist, and then they say, I've got double vision. So guess what? They get an MRI of the brain. Well, then the radiologist looks at the brain, but they don't necessarily look at the orbit. And so I routinely will see people with thyroid eye disease, double vision, get a scan, normal, but they don't look at the orbit. Now, this guy didn't have thyroid eye disease. What he has is this very large superior oblique muscle. And this was a metastasis from his gastric cancer to the superior oblique muscle, which indeed killed him. So this, in this case, was deadly. But that's why you look at the films. That's why you look at the MRIs or the CAT scans, because they looked at his brain, and sure enough, the brain was normal, but the orbit was not. And this large superior oblique muscle was giving him this acquired Brown syndrome. So 
unfortunately, in his case, this was deadly. Okay. All right, here's a 75-year-old woman saw me on her way home from the hospital uh, with double vision. Here are her eye movements. This is up, wait a minute, up, right, left, down. You want to see that again? Up, and hold on, I'll show it again. So up, right, left, and down. Okay, those are her eye movements. Fairly straightforward. Her pupils were normal. Her lids, eh, maybe a little droopy. So what do you think? Is this CPEO? Is this the Guillain-Barre or a, a, rel a variety of that? Is it myasthenia gravis or thyroid eye disease? And it probably wasn't fair because I didn't tell you the history. All I told you was that she had double vision. So we'll see what you say and then we can talk why the history might help depending on how you vote. 10 seconds. Five, four, three, two, one, go ahead. So let's show the results. All right, so yeah, a lot of you said CPO. So the part of the history I left out, which was not fair, was that this happened two weeks ago. Um, and so clearly you wouldn't expect CPO in a 75 year old to start to be symptomatic two weeks ago. Interestingly, CPO usually doesn't cause double vision either. So although her eyes did not move at all, and clearly CPO is in the differential diagnosis, as is myasthenia gravis, I suppose thyroid eye disease could be in the differential, although I would put that, a, I've never seen that, uh, but I'd put that a distant fourth. Um, she, in fact, had a two-week history, and her history was that um, she's a healthy 75-year-old, and she had some sort of a GI you know, problem, a gastrointestinal problem, a little diarrhea for a couple of days, that got better. But then about a week after that, she developed double vision. And they did all sorts of testing, including acetylcholine receptor antibodies, tensile on testing, MRIs, you, know, you name it, everything was normal. They did, uh, to their credit, send a blood test that it took a little while for the result to come back. Um, and the result did come back uh, with um, anti-GQ1B antibodies um, greater than one, uh, 1 to 1024. Uh, and this is also known as the Miller-Fisher variant of Guillain-Barre. So there's usually some sort of viral prodrome, but in this scenario, um, the eye part of it is the prominent part, not the typical Guillain-Barre. So that's the Miller-Fisher variant and these anti-GQ1B antibodies have a predilection for the intranodal areas on ocular, motor, cranial nerves. So you can see any degree of ophthalmoplegia. What I'm showing you, obviously, is about as bad as it gets. Her eyes weren't moving. She was slightly esotropic, which is why she had diplopia. Um, but, it, but you can see this triad of ophthalmoplegia, areflexia, and ataxia. She really had very little ataxia. She did have some areflexia. So she had this Miller or Fisher variant. This usually is not debilitating or deadly because it's more eye stuff than the typical Guillain-Barre, but it can obviously be debilitating. Um, in her case, um, she received intravenous immunoglobulin and was followed. I saw her six weeks later and I told her, you know, usually this gets better. And she came back in six weeks and she said, you lied to me, I am no better. And here are eye movements. Fortunately, her daughter was with her both times and said, Mom, your eyes are moving way better. But why is she no better? Because she still has a little esotropia. And sure enough, six weeks later, so three months after the start, she did have resolution of the small amount of esotropia. But you can see that her eyes are obviously moving much, much better six weeks after the start of this and after the intravenous immunoglobulin. So the Miller-Fisher variant anti-GQ1B antibody syndrome. All right, um, here's a patient who has a very, uh, to me, almost pathognomonic complaint. And the complaint is that inter I have intermittent oscillopsia. Now, they don't say oscillopsia, but they say every once in a while, with my left eye only or my right eye only, everything I'm looking at moves or it shimmers 
Uh, I close my eye in question and the other eye, it's fine. Everything looks totally normal. But when I close the eye, the good eye, everything I'm looking at is moving, usually sort of up and down or sideways uh, or obliquely, obliquely. And here are what the eye movements look like. And this is all you see on exam. So you want to look at the slit lamp. You want to look. You can see some of it, but really the best thing to do is what I'll do in a moment is to look at the, conju the nasal conjunctival vessels. You can see a little bit of movement of this iris right now. And here, let's, I'm trying to focus on those nasal, con look at the, see that movement? It'll get better focus in a second. There we go. There we go. You see that little bit of movement there? That's it. All you see, and it's unilateral. So the question is, what is this? Unilateral, is this opsoclonus? Is this superior oblique myokinia? Downbeat nystagmus or fourth nerve palsy? All right, so most of you, 82%, got it right. So none of these other things, opsoclonus is going to be conjugate. Downbeat nystagmus is going to be conjugate. So those are not good answers because this, I said, clearly was unilateral. Fourth nerve palsy is not going to give you this movement of the eye. Superiorly myokinia, myokinia means the muscles firing when it shouldn't, basically. And we think it's probably not a problem with the muscle. It was probably a problem with the nerve, the fourth nerve, sending an inappropriate signal. So sort of the opposite of fourth nerve palsy, a little bit too much, kind of like hemifacial spasm. When there's a little blood vessel irritating the seventh nerve, you can see inappropriate facial Twitching, spasming, uh, because the seventh nerve fires when it shouldn't. We think for the, the superior oblique myokinia is similar to that. I'll show it again. You're looking for small, intorsive movements. So this is the right eye. We're looking at the nasal conjunctiva. But that's all you see. And these patients will often come in and say, you know, I've had this happen once in a while over the years. I go to doctors. They can't see anything, even when it's happened. They say everything looks fine. They just want to be reassured sometimes, but sometimes not. Sometimes it really can be debilitating, as you might imagine. Um, the, the treatment strategy for this uh, is, um, uh, oops, I don't have the treatment strategy, are um, beta blocking drops. I usually start with just a drop once or twice a day of betoptic, hemoptic, once or twice a day. That works for some people, but not a lot of people, but it's easy. Uh, if that doesn't work, you can try oral beta blockers. If that doesn't work, something like Tegretol or, um, uh, excuse me, carbamazepine or um, gabapentin have been tried, and there's even been eye muscle surgery done, and one or two reports of neurosurgical microvascular decompression of the fourth nerve, finding a little blood vessel, just like with hemifacial spasm um, and the seventh nerve. So definitely can be debilitating. All right, we're getting towards the end here. Um, this is um, a woman who, let's see, do I have, a, I don't think I have a question slide on this one. So she's got funny looking eye movement. So when she, when she looks, she's got a little bit of ptosis on the left. When she looks up, the left eye moves in. Both eyes look to the right and to the left okay. But when she looks down, the left eye moves in. So in up gaze, she is esotropic, and in down gaze, she's esotropic. And she, I, I can't ask you a question verbally, unfortunately, but so she, the history is that she had an aneurysm on the left, the posterior communicating artery aneurysm, and it caused a third nerve palsy, but they fixed it. And her third nerve palsy improved up to this point. And we're now like more than six months out. And so what we're seeing here is aberrant regeneration of the third nerve. So when she looks up and her brain says, okay, superior rectus, fire, some of those fibers that used to go to the superior rectus are now going to the medial rectus. And when she looks down and her brain says, okay, inferior rectus, fire, some of those fibers that used to go to the medial rectus are going to the inferior rectus. I'm sorry, some of the fibers that go to the inferior rectus are going to the medial rectus. So she has this funny kind of looking eye movement. So you'll notice little ptosis. Usually people will have a little, in the setting of third nerve aberrant regeneration, a pupil abnormality. The pupil will be a little bigger, won't react quite as well, usually. So she's got third nerve aberrant regeneration. This can occur frequently after 
uh, compressive or traumatic third nerve palsy, something that's crushed the third nerve and disrupted the architecture. So when those fibers regenerate, they don't really go to the right place. Third nerve aberrant regeneration. And definitely can be debilitating and very tough to fix. As you might imagine, you cannot go back in and rewire her. Oh, all right. Oh, I guess I'm telling you what this is. This is just a fun, a fun video. This, I forget why. I think the guy, I think he was sent in with this, but he says, this problem is something I've had my whole life. He says, I do this at parties to entertain people. Now watch when he tilts his head up. See him moving his jaw? So this is what's called Marcus Gun Jaw Winking, if you haven't seen it. Um, this is a, um, a problem with aberrant, not aberrant, mis- direction of fibers between the fifth nerve, motor five uh, and seven. And so if you could hear the video when he does this, he's makes a, he makes a noise like eh, eh, noise <laughs> whenever he does it. It was, it was rather fun. And so obviously I asked him to get a video because it was interesting. So this is dubious. This is not a problem. This is not something that needs to be imaged. These people usually know about it or it'll be discovered at, at a young age. And of course, it'll upset the parents. All right, this may be my last case, and we'll go to questions. So this is a guy, he's got a, a no double vision, but he was sent to me because of um, uh, a number of things. Not, well, mostly one thing, and that is he has a little bit, it's hard to see it in this, a little anisocoria. Uh, the right pupil is a little smaller than the left. And there was very slight ptosis. But let's watch it as eye, his eye movements. And I'm trying to show you a particular finding. And that is, I'm asking him to, his eye movements look pretty good. But then I'm going to ask him to look straight ahead, close your eyes, keep looking straight ahead, and then open your eyes. And watch what happens. Now open. Oh, his eyes are deviated to the right. Watch. And I'm telling him, keep your eyes straight ahead. But as soon as he closes his eyes, behind his eyelids when he's not able to focus on something, they drift to the side. They drift to the side. And I think, and this is a tough one. I, I'll give you another hint. He's got a right Horner syndrome. It's mild, but he has a little anisocoria, worse in the dark, and a little tiny bit of ptosis. And he's got this eye finding. And there's a bit more to this um, syndrome. But the question is, what is this syndrome called? Is this a Weber syndrome, a one and a half syndrome, a paranoid syndrome, or a Wallenberg syndrome? I know all of you probably love eponyms. Okay, so we've got a mixed bag here. Um, almost even, the majority of people said paranoid. Here's one where you're not correct. Um, the next, next most popular was Wallenberg. Those people are correct. So let's get rid of the polling. And... So this fellow has a lateral medullary syndrome, which is usually due to a stroke in the distribution of the posterior inferior cerebellar artery, the pica. Um, and they get, typically they can get a, an ipsilateral horners, ipsilateral facial numbness, contralateral body numbness, and something called ocular lateral pulsion. And that's what you're seeing. When he closes his eyes and he can't fit, his brain can't fixate, the eyes go to the side, to the right, to, to the same side, to the ipsilateral side. So this is called ocular lateral pulsion. And there it is. And it can be deadly because if you have a, a stroke or a tumor in this area, usually it's stroke, not tumor, could kill you potentially. Definitely, it could be debilitating. He did very well. I mean, he really had no specific eye symptoms, but they made him come to me. They knew he had a Wallenberg syndrome. They knew he had a posterior inferior cerebellar artery infarct, and they wanted me to just look at his eyes and make sure there wasn't anything else going on. All right, so in summary, for wacky and weird eye movements, there are a variety of pathognomonic eye movement disorders. Some are a nuisance, some can be deadly, some are party tricks. Uh, thus, recognizing these patterns is essential. So with that, I'd like to go, move on to um, see if there are questions. Does the time interval of reversal of abduction and adduction capacity depend on the basic tone of the muscles and ocular neuromyotonia? The answer is I have no idea. 
Um, as you might imagine, the ocular neuro, it's ocular neuromyotonia is it's pretty rare, at least I don't see it that much. Um, there's not really been any, I'd say, uh, good scientific studies on it. So we don't even know for sure, you know, is this really a faptic transmission or is it something else? Um, another question. I have an 18-year-old uh, myopic who developed sudden onset squint while studying for an exam. I thought it was sudden onset squint and myope was planning surgery. Could it be spasm of the near comp? Yeah. Well, so the answer is, I suppose, I mean, again, you would, you'd want to look to see if there is meiosis um, and if there, if, is it a, is it a comitant misalignment? Um, sometimes if they're, you know, if they're, if they're, well, mine is say it's not that bad, you know, big eyes can actually give you a little ESO deviation too. Um, I guess the question is, as long as it's constantly, um, constantly, the person's constantly tropic, then it's probably not spasm of the near reflex. On the other hand, if they have really small pupils, um, you could, uh, throw some atropine in, tell them obviously that they're going to have blurry vision up close for a couple of days and see if you can break, break a near spasm of the near reflex. Um, I see some questions on the chat side of things too. So uh, what eye movement disorder are seen in corpus callosal agenesis? Good question. I've never seen corpus callosum agenesis. Um, however, I did see that question on the pre-question, so I looked it up. The answer is I couldn't find much. Um, so I don't know, and I can't imagine it'll ever be relevant. Do eye movement deficits reflect deficits in eye or manifestations of brain insults or both? Well, obviously it could be anywhere from eye muscles to the neuromuscular junction, to the cranial nerves, to the brain stem, to even uh, the, cortex, the brain cortex. Um, so it says if both, which precedes what? I, I don't know, that question doesn't make any sense. If this is not covered, what information should a primary care provider collect and provide with a referral? Uh, um, well, I think that if we're talking about eye movement issues specifically, um, usually the reason that a primary care provider would be concerned about eye movements is because the patient complains of double vision. And really, in my opinion, the only thing I need to know from a primary care doctor if the patient has double vision is, is it monocular or is it binocular? Because it's monocular, I won't see the patient because it's not gonna be neurologic. So the question for the primary care physician, the number one most important question if the patient has double vision is simply, does it go away when you cover either eye? If it's present with either eye covered, it is monocular and it is not neuroophthalmic and I will not see it. Um, do you do neuroimaging for all patients with astagmus? Certainly, all patients with acquired nystagmus get imaging. If the nystagmus is present um, from birth, then maybe not. That's a whole nother lecture. Uh, uh, I have a lecture on nystagmus. That's a whole nother lecture. Would you please say the difference between uh, square wave jerks and macrosaccadic oscillations? Um, I probably can't explain it very well. You're probably going to need eye movement recording devices to tell for sure the difference. Uh, I guess. Square wave jerks are normal in individuals. You can see them more commonly in Parkinson's, things like that. Um, Macrosychotic oscillations are larger than, square, than normal square wave jerks. To really differentiate the two, I think you probably need um, eye movement recording system. Um, and then vertical nystagmus in one month old child with congenital cataract became more of horizontal in the next one month, why so? Ah, I have no idea, uh, but I'm going to image any child with vertical nystagmus because that's not typical congenital nystagmus. So that in my lecture on, on childhood nystagmus, that would buy that patient imaging. Um, you can see weird monocular nystagmus with congenital cataracts at times, but I would probably still image them if they have vertical nystagmus. Um, another question from the group here. Um, Let's see, I want to know if, there, if you are using eye trackers in your daily practice for precise assessments. I am not. Uh, I do have, of course, friends and colleagues who do. We just don't have eye movement tracking system available here. I just um, personally have never really investigated because I don't think it's going to help me much in my practice in clinical neuro-ophthalmology. Um, Vertical another question. Vertical nystagmus with congenital cataracts also, will you image? Yes, Ver if it's vertical. 
Um, all right, I think that is the end of the questions. Um, if so, I thank everyone for their attention. Um, please, if you're fill, wait, please fill out, I think there's an evaluation form. Please fill that out. Um, and then if there are suggestions, you know, we always are trying to make these better. Also, um, you know, if there are suggestions for future neuro-ophthalmology, uh, that would help me uh, because I'm kind of out of topics. Um, you know, we record the webinars, so I don't know that it makes a lot of sense to repeat webinars on the same topic. But certainly, I'd be happy to entertain suggestions for future neuro-ophthalmology lectures. Um, and with that, I think it's about 10 o'clock my time, uh, which means our hour is up. Thank you, everyone, and uh, have a good day or night or whatever time it is for you.